Jesus is the pivotal point between Christianity and Islam. Stop, let's think about this for a second. Islam teaches monotheism. Islam teaches following God, worshiping God. Islam teaches a lot. There's a lot of violence there, but again, a lot of violence looks similar somewhat to the Old Testament. What is the pivotal point as far as we're concerned? Well, when we talk about Jesus' life in Islam, what does Islam deny? Well, first, we've seen that Islam denies Jesus' crucifixion. Chapter 4, verse 157. He was not killed, nor was he crucified, but so it was made to appear to them. So Jesus did not die on the cross, according to Islam. If he did not die on the cross, he could not have been raised from the dead. So Jesus' resurrection is denied by Islam. And then, of course, we have chapter 5, verse 72 of the Quran, where if you believe Jesus is God, then you will go to hell. Chapter 5, verse 116 of the Quran, where Jesus denies ever claiming to be divine. So what do we have? In the Quran, chapter 3, you can believe Jesus cleansed the lepers, that he healed the blind, he healed the deaf, he raised the dead. He is the virgin-born Messiah, son of Mary. He is the one who's going to come back at the end of times. You can believe all that, but don't you believe that he died on the cross or that he rose from the dead or that he is God? What does Romans chapter 10 verse 9 tell us? If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The exact three things that Islam denies about Jesus are the exact three things we have to believe in order to be saved. Death, deity, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's not a coincidence in my book. So the polemic then hinges, uh, the Islamic polemic against Christianity hinges on Christology. Who was Jesus? Did he die on the cross? Did he claim to be God? The issue of the resurrection is usually presented in a secondary fashion, and that makes sense. Um, it's secondary to the crucifixion. But did he rise from the dead? That matters. These are important issues. And so what we're going to go through right now is what some of you uh, would term Christian apologetics, but it's intimately related to Islamic apologetics, and we're going to be looking at this from a, an Islamic lens. But the same issues you would see elsewhere. The first one we want to talk about is, did Jesus die by crucifixion? Here's the verse in chapter 4, verse 157. And because of their saying, we slew the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, Allah's messenger, they slew him not, nor crucified him, but it appeared so unto them. And lo, those who disagree concerning it are in doubt thereof. They have no knowledge thereof, save pursuit of a conjecture. They certainly slew him not. I call this the Islamic litmus test. I believe that if you're dealing with a Muslim who is providing an apologetic against Christianity, you can test whether that Muslim is sincere or not through this issue. And that's why I call it the litmus test. <coughs> this issue is so starkly in favor of the Christian position that if a Muslim argues against it after having seen the evidence, I have to conclude that they're not being genuine. There's nothing you could say to them that could, that could uh, convince them of the strength of the Christian claim. Let's take a look at the reasons why. There's two lines of evidence that I use. Um, this is, the evidence I'm providing here is basically a recap of a debate I had in 2009, I believe, might have been 2010, with a man named uh, Osama Abdullah on the issue of the resurrection of Jesus. Two lines of evidence, historical evidence and supporting evidence that we're going to provide. First, the historical evidence. Did Jesus die by crucifixion? Well, first, it is the unanimous written testimony concerning what happened to Jesus. When we look at Jewish references, we have multiple Jewish references. We've got the Talmud, we've got Marabar Serapian who's writing a letter, We've got Josephus, the Jewish historian, uh, who's writing for the Romans. All of these Jewish sources say Jesus died. 
by crucifixion, as it were. We have Gentile sources. We've got Tacitus and Lucian, both of whom say that Jesus died. Of course, you've got first-generation Christians, uh, and by that I mean Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, Peter. Um, these folk all say Jesus died on the cross. It is the unanimous testimony of early Christianity, and it's the unanimous testimony of second-generation Christianity. Folks like Papias, um, Clement, Polycarp, Ignatius. That this is what people say happened to Jesus mattered. It does matter. On the flip side, the fact that there's no reference to the fact that Jesus may have survived crucifixion also matters. Nobody even dares to say Jesus survived crucifixion. And the reason why is because people knew what crucifixion was back then. Today, when we'll say, perhaps Jesus survived the crucifixion, uh, we are basically showing ignorance of what the crucifixion process was. For those of you who have not, I would highly suggest you get into, uh, acquainted with Martin Hengel's book, Crucifixion. Martin Hengel, great European scholar, what was really great about him is that he wrote a really tiny book. <laughs> and it was called Crucifixion. Um, easy to read. Uh, gives you a whole new perspective on how ghastly the crucifixion was. How difficult the process was. As it turns out, people used to say, let no Roman citizen even hear the word crucifixion. It is so horrendous. The word crucifixion is where we get our word excruciating from. Ex cruz, off the cross. You had to invent a word to describe how bad the crucifixion is. The process of crucifixion starts with flogging. Uh, it is called the pre-death in some works because people were flogged not with just a stick but with a Roman whip called the cat of nine tails. This whip often had about six leather cords that came off of it. And at the end of these leather cords were leather balls, which had shards of bone and metal dumbbells attached to them. Well, what was the point of these shards of bone and these metal dumbbells? When striking a victim, the metal dumbbells would cause vasodilation. It would cause pain receptors to become acute. Um, it would cause blood vessels to dilate thereby weakening people even more when those shards of bone would grab into the skin and pull it off. So the skin was literally pulled off and blood was profuse because of those metal dumbbells. It was very uh, intelligently designed for the purpose of weakening a victim. In the process of flogging, it has been said that intestines were spilt because the abdominal wall was weakened so much the intestines came out. This happened on a few occasions. People sometimes died during the flogging process. The whole body was flogged. The whole body was flogged. It was horrific, to say the least. The point of the flogging was so that people would not be able to kick and fight when they would be nailed to the cross. They would be on the verge of death, as it were, already. Now, what we know about flogging is that Jews were not allowed to flog more than 40 times. According to Old Testament law, you could flog 40 and no more. And what the Jews would do is they would stop at 39, just to make sure that they didn't accidentally miscount while they're flogging. They didn't want to break God's law. The Romans, in spite of the Jews, would therefore flog more than 40 times to show them, hey, we're not bound by your silly little laws. We're going to flog as much as we want. And so the flogging was often very protracted. It is at this point that the victim would then be made to sometimes carry the cross beam to the point of the cross. Um, not the entire cross, just the cross beam. And they would walk to that place. Uh, by the way, um, they're being flogged while naked. Uh, and they're being crucified while naked. Cheers. 
Let's put it there. Um, so all those wonderful paintings we have of Christ with the loincloth on are lessening the humiliation that our Lord suffered. He was naked on the cross. When being placed on the cross, nails were driven through the arms, not the hands, as is often depicted in medieval uh, statements. The reason why is because uh, back in those days when someone said hand, they pictured this whole area, not just this area. Um, so it was, it was okay to say hands and still mean here. Um, but this is the only place the weight of a person could be supported here between the radia, radius and the ulna. Um, and guess what runs right through there? The median nerve. All right. So if you've ever hit your elbow on your funny bone, imagine piercing it with a nail. It destroys your hands. The, the median nerve is the main sensory motor nerve of the hand. Um, and it destroys your hands. As you're nailed there, your feet are, your knees are bent slightly, and one ankle is placed over the other, and a nine inch nail is driven through your feet. Uh, this is for more than just torture, though. This is to give you a means to push yourself off of the nail. Uh, when you are hanging in this position, if you hang, if you're just hanging, you will not be able to breathe out. You'll breathe in, and then to breathe out, you have to have some room. You have to have some uh, positive pressure develop, and so you, you, your rib cage needs to collapse. And in order to do that, you have to push out. That is what the nail in your feet was for. So you'd push up to be able to breathe out. Otherwise, the victim would die very quickly. And so that nail was actually an additional torture device to make sure that your death was protracted, it was long. And by the way, every time you're pushing up to breathe out, you're scraping a back that has no skin against splintered wood. This is not a fun process. Uh, and when you are at the point of death, all the Roman soldiers have to do is see that you're not moving anymore. If you're not moving, you're not breathing, you're dead. But they didn't stop there, because if they weren't sure that you were dead, you could, uh, the Roman soldier could lose their job, be killed. Uh, if they weren't sure you were dead. So what they'd often do is they'd administer death blows. This is why the knees of the robbers alongside Jesus were broken. By breaking their knees, they were not able to push up, they would stop breathing and they would die. Jesus had already given up his spirit and so they pierced his heart with a spear. Other forms of death blows included crushing the skull with a sledgehammer it included lighting people on fire, um, all kinds of horrific ways to crucify people. Anyone who knows the process knows that you will die by crucifixion. There is no account of anybody in history surviving a full Roman crucifixion. There is an account of Josephus seeing two of, uh, three friends being crucified they weren't done being crucified. They were on the cross, but they weren't given a death blow or anything of that sort. Their knees hadn't been broken. And he asked for them to be taken down immediately. They were taken down. And two of the three of them died anyway, even though they were given the best Roman medical treatment. One of them survived, but guess what? He didn't have a full crucifixion. He didn't have a death blow. There is no account of anyone surviving a full Roman crucifixion. So. To argue that Jesus survived the cross, or that he did not die on the cross, is to argue against the facts, strongly against the facts. And this is why no one says that Jesus survived crucifixion. It's unthinkable. It's unthinkable that someone would survive crucifixion. That's the historical evidence that we have. But there's also supporting evidence. Scholarship has repeatedly affirmed today that Jesus' death on the cross is the one thing we can be most certain about concerning his life. Paula Fredrickson has said that. Bart Ehrman has said that. Gert Ludemann has said that. So many people have said that, it's silly uh, to even think that scholarship might think otherwise. It's the unanimous testimony of scholarship. If we can know anything about Jesus' life, is that he died on the cross. That's what they'll say. So the scholarly consensus is quite strong. In addition, the centrality of Jesus' death on the cross to the Christian message 
kind of mandates that Jesus have died on the cross in order for Christianity to have spread the way it did. That he died on the cross and rose is central to the Christian propagation of the message. Had he not died on the cross, then it wouldn't have been possible for Christianity to have spread the way it did. Again, this is supporting evidence. It's not as strong as the historical evidence was. Um, we also have the issue of prophecies in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, it seems that the righteous one would be crushed for the sins of many. You have Isaiah 53. You have an image in Psalm 22, what Jesus himself quotes on the cross. Uh, when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's quoting Psalm 22. The righteous servant that is suffering, uh, that is pierced. Um, so you have prophecies in the Old Testament that support this as well. Again, supporting evidence. The primary evidence is the historical evidence. <coughs> Historically speaking, there is not one shred of evidence that Jesus survived crucifixion, not one. When people began to propose that theory, it was... Um, lovingly titled by Josh McDowell, The Swoon Theory. Um, when people began uh, proposing the swoon theory back in the 18th century, an atheist by the name of David Strauss wrote a critique. It's called the Strauss Critique. And he said that the swoon theory, he didn't call it the swoon theory, but the idea that Jesus did not die on the cross is untenable because not only would Jesus then have had to uh, break out of the tomb with broken hands and feet and you know, go through and fight these guards and move out of there, you know, that's virtually impossible for a man who had just survived crucifixion. But he would also have to convince the disciples that he was the risen Lord. Well, if you've got a man who barely survived crucifixion, he doesn't look like the risen Lord. The disciples might say, we got to get you to the hospital or whatever they had. You know, we got to get you to medical care. That's how they would respond if Jesus had just survived crucifixion. The fact that he was considered the risen Lord, precludes the option that he had just survived crucifixion. That's called the Strauss Critique. And in Western scholarship, that ended the swoon theory. And uh, David Strauss was not a Christian. Um, he wrote uh, one of the most inflammatory works against Christianity for the time. Um, but the Strauss Critique remains the strongest critique of the swoon theory, um, or the apparent death theory, as it's often called. So the Islamic explanations for 4157, how do they respond to all this? What is their case? The primary one that's used, and the one that was used initially by Muslim scholars, is the substitution theory. It says that Jesus was not killed, nor was he crucified. So Muslims will often say, Jesus was never even put on the cross. And the next part of the verse says, but so it was made to appear to them. They say, Allah made it look like Jesus was put on the cross. Well, how did he do that? The earliest Muslim uh, explanations for this is that Allah put Jesus' face on somebody else. And somebody else was crucified in his place. Whom, you might ask? Judas, Judas is one example that Muslims use uh, in a case of cosmic justice. Um, Ju Judas uh, was put on the cross in place of Jesus. Another is Simon of Cyrene. Some of the more apologetically minded folk will say, ah, look, Simon of Cyrene had to carry Jesus' cross. At that time, they confused Simon with Jesus. Never mind the bloody mess that Jesus was. They confused Simon of Cyrene with Jesus, and he was placed on the cross instead. These are the substitution arguments that are used. Um, and Muslims, by the way, have the advantage over atheists and agnostics to say that God made it look like that. And certainly God has the potential to do that. The next most common theory, and I see this being espoused more and more by Muslim apologists, is the theistic swoon theory. Um, it's a swoon theory with theistic bent on it. That Allah allowed for Jesus' survival on the cross. Uh, if Allah can raise him from the dead, as you Christians say he can, why could he not save him from dying in the first place? A legitimate argument, um, but it yields a dilemma. And the dilemma is, and I think it's a dilemma for both uh, of these positions. It stems from chapter three, verse 55 of the Quran. Now chapter three, verse 55 of the Quran says that Jesus' disciples would be uppermost 
until the day of resurrection. Jesus' disciples would be uppermost until the day of resurrection. In other words, Christians, uh, especially those who immediately came from him, would be on top. They would be superior in whatever way. Um, to say that Jesus did not die on the cross, but it looked like he died on the cross, would explain why the disciples then went and started preaching the risen Jesus. They thought he died, and then they saw him alive. Now they're preaching the risen Jesus. That makes sense, okay? That fits. But they're doing that because Allah tricked them. You have a deceptive God at this point. In other words, the Christian faith was started because Allah deceived the disciples. If Allah put somebody else's face on Jesus, or if Allah miraculously kept Jesus alive, the disciples who then went out and preached the risen Jesus, they were tricked by Allah. They were deceived. Are they to be blamed? Is it their fault? Maybe, maybe the blame should be on them and not on Allah. No, the Quran says, 355, that they were uppermost. The disciples weren't bad. They were good guys, according to 355. So deception has to be on Allah in this case. Or perhaps, perhaps, Allah left that up to Jesus. Jesus explained to them that you didn't die on the cross, uh, and Jesus didn't do it. Then we're left with an incompetent Messiah. Then we're left with an incompetent Messiah. Would Jesus really have done that? In fact, we're left with an incompetent Messiah anyway, because Jesus wasn't able to adequately explain to his disciples, no, I'm not God. No, I didn't die on the cross for your sins. He wasn't adequately able to explain that. So the dilemma we're left with here by the Islamic position is we're either given an incompetent God, I'm sorry, a deceptive God or an incompetent Messiah. Regardless, in either case, Allah is responsible for Christianity. And if Christianity is shirk, is the unforgivable sin, then Allah is responsible for creating the religion which led the most people to hell in all of history. Call this the Islamic dilemma. Yes, sir. How have they responded to that if you brought it up to them? Poorly. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, can, uh, you can watch it in debates. Whenever we've debated the issue of Jesus' death on the cross or his resurrection, this issue comes up. Uh, and a common Muslim tactic, and this is why I had so much respect for Bassam Zawadi. He didn't do this. A common Muslim tactic in debates is to simply ignore what you said. Just ignore it. Pretend it wasn't said. Um, and... Uh, Islamic rhetoric is so good because you have Muslims are still, uh, a lot of them are coming from oral societies. Um, not necessarily that they don't know how to read, that's not what I'm saying, uh, but oral prowess is highly revered. Um, and so they have good rhetorical skill. And you're in the middle of this debate and uh, they just won't respond and they'll, you know, dazzle you with smoke and mirrors over here. Um, and uh, a lot of people won't notice the lack of response. But if you watch the debates, you'll see that they have not been able to respond to this well. It's a great question. It is one of the 99 names. Uh, the question was that, uh, uh, isn't one of the 99 names of Allah that he is a deceiver? Um, in the Quran, there's a verse, uh, I forget where, um, which says that they planned to deceive you, talking about the enemies of Muhammad. Um, and then it says, but Allah planned to deceive them, and Allah is the best of deceivers. Um, so from that, uh, you get the name for Allah. The idea is, you know, I think from that kind of social context, the idea is, look, they're trying to be resourceful in this way against you, and Allah is more resourceful against them, but it's still deceptive. But deception wasn't as negative back then as it is to us now. So now, what Muslims are often doing is they're changing that word from deceiver to schemer. Schemer is not quite as bad as deceiver. <laughs> and then people are going a step further, and they're going from schemer to planner. And they planned against you, and Allah planned against them, and Allah is the best of planners. Um, so that's kind of how they're taking it, and they'll try to defend that translation. So that's how they respond to that. Any other questions here? Extremely important to be well versed with this. Now, when you, um, the reason I bring this up and spend so much time on it is, uh, if you read, for example, the case for the resurrection of Jesus back there, that uh, Michael Lacona and Gary Habermas's book, they don't spend as much time on the death of Jesus on the cross. Um, most 
uh, Christian apologetic works just simply don't because they assume you already believe it. Everyone already believes Jesus died on the cross, right? So here you go, let's move on. Let's talk about the fact that he rose. Um, even in the, the four point response that Mike gives, uh, you know, fact number two, you know, fact number one. Uh, no, it's fact number one. Fact number one, Jesus died on the cross. It, he just gives it as a fact. It's like, here's a basis that we're starting with. Okay, this is a fact that everyone agrees with. Let's move on. It's like he doesn't spend too much time on it, and he really ought not to. It's so obvious. Um, but when you're debating Muslims or when you're dialoguing with Muslims, this is an important point to bring up. Could, could their um, concept of divine determination justify the deceptive God theory because via divine determination, Christians were going to go to hell anyway? So this is just his way of leading them to hell? That's a great question. So the question was, could their view of God's divine determination uh, affect whether or not Ma uh, Allah is a planner uh, or a schemer or a deceiver? Uh, and I would say indirectly, yes. They never feel like they have to defend God's character because God can be whoever he wants to be. Uh, there's a lot, more of a, um, a lot more of an arbitrary nature to Allah in Islam than there is in Christianity. Um, now, some, some Islamic philosophy has dealt with that. Uh, but a lot of the beautiful Islamic philosophy um, was undertaken by Muslims called the Mutazili. Um, the Mutazili were around early in Islamic history. And they, they imported a lot of Greek philosophy, uh, Aristotle especially. And they were putting together some coherent thoughts. They were, they were introducing reason into the faith. Um, and the Ash'aris who fought against them said, you're doing this all wrong. You're bringing foreign thought in. That's not what Islam is about. There was a big battle between the Ash'aris and the Mutazilis, and the Ash'aris won. So some of the really good philosophy that tried to reconcile this stuff was early on, and no one pays any attention to it. Yes, sir. I've heard that Muslims do believe in the resurrection of Jesus or a rapture or something like that, and they also believe in his virgin birth. Yeah, the virgin birth, definitely. I mean, you see that. The, virgin, the question was, does, um, do Muslims believe in the virgin birth and in some kind of ascension of Jesus? Uh, and the answer is yes. The Quran says Jesus was virgin born. Clear as day. He was born of a virgin. Um, purpose to that? I mean, why would he be born of a virgin and no one else? No purpose is given. Oh. Um, it was just God demonstrating his power. He could, he could, have, a, you know, he could have Jesus born without a father if he wanted to. Um, so, yeah, no necessary purpose for that, um, and uh, no, I'm not going to get into that. The resurrection yeah, and it also says uh, in the Quran, uh, ilayya, and, and we lifted him up to ourselves. And Muslims believe that means that Jesus ascended into heaven, um, and, and that is why he will return at the end of times. Um, again, from that tower in Damascus to start the latter days. So Muslims believe Jesus is going to start the latter days, initiate it by his return. So Muslims and Christians are waiting for the return of Jesus. Um, yeah, and that's, it's in the Quran uh, that we lifted him up to ourselves. Now some Muslims argue that that means in status. Uh, we raise Jesus up to ourselves. They'll say that means in status. Because there's another verse which kind of implies that Jesus did die here on this earth, that he wasn't raised. Um, so some Muslims will say that meant God lifted him up in status. Uh, other Muslims will say the verse that says Jesus died, that's talking about in the future. Jesus is going to come back and then he'll die. Um, so you have some disagreement there. Again, I'm, I'm not big on Islamic eschatology, so uh, if you want to look into this a bit more, uh, read the work of David Cook uh, out of Rice University. Um, I focus more on the historical aspects. Is that Joel Richardson, I think? Yeah. 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 I haven't read it. Okay. He has 20, 22 parallels between biblical eschatology and Islamic eschatology, and they're just the flip side of the coin. It's, been, it's amazing. Yeah, there's a lot of parallels in eschatology, um, but there's a lot, a lot of disparity, not much unity in Islamic eschatology. Uh, I asked my friend, the same friend who, uh, who said he couldn't be my friend anymore, I asked him what he thought about the afterlife. He sent me a 33 CD lecture series. <laughs> Um, on uh, Al Akhirah. Um, I tried to listen to him, but I just I couldn't bear it after a while. So I don't I don't know much about Islamic eschatology, so I apologize. Now I know what I was taught, um, 
which is not too indicative of what everyone else was taught, because our sect of Islam believed different things about eschatology than others did. Um, our sect was pacifist, and so we didn't have an image of Jesus coming and killing all, all kinds of people and fighting. That wasn't what ours was taught, but ours was idiosyncratic. So. Well, what Richardson points out in his book is that, you know, Islam is waiting for two people. The Mahdi and the Messiah, yeah. Yeah, that's fascinating because if you know Revelation well, <laughs> mm. Satan brings two people onto the scene, so anyway, I won't spoil it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Appreciate the uh, consideration. Yeah, I saw another question a moment ago. Okay. So, we have covered the issue of Jesus' crucifixion. Extremely important. Don't overlook it when dealing with Islamic apologetics. But even more important than that, uh, in Muslims' eyes, is the claim to Jesus' deity. Now, I would say the case for Jesus' deity is very strong. Very strong. Um, I would say the case for Jesus' death on the cross is airtight. You see the difference there. Um, there's no room to say Jesus did not die on the cross when coming from a historical perspective. So that's why I call the issue of Jesus' crucifixion the litmus test, the Islamic litmus test. If you have a friend who's arguing various issues with you, Islamic issues with you, and he is willing to say that Jesus did not die on the cross, you present all the evidence to him. When he comes back, and he says, I don't think Jesus died on the cross. You ask him why. And if he says, well, the evidence is just not strong enough. Like I said before, you cannot show him anything from that point forward. There's nothing he will agree with if he didn't agree with that. But if he comes back and says, I don't agree that he died on the cross, and you say, why? He says, I admit the historical evidence is, is in your favor. Uh, but it just doesn't fit my image of Jesus. Uh, I, would have to, I would have to be convinced of a lot more in order to think that he died on the cross. Um, so I'll concede that the evidence is in your favor. If he says that, then you've got someone you can start reasoning with. Um, so a question is often asked to me, Nabil, when, when I share the gospel with Muslims, it's so difficult, I don't get any headway. Um, you know, should I be talking about these things? Should I be discussing these things? I never, by the way, suggest stop being friends with that person, stop witnessing. I say stop discussing these issues with them if they're not showing a willingness to hear you out. Um, still share the love of Christ with them, still walk with them, uh, still be friends with them, but the issue of discussion might need to come to a close at least for a while <coughs> until they can be a little bit more intellectually honest. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's because it's airtight. There's no two ways about it. History is absolutely clear about Jesus' death on the cross. If a Muslim wants to believe he did not die, he has to concede that it's a theological presupposition, not a conclusion of the evidence. The argument for Jesus' deity, though, it's still very strong. Though not airtight, it's still very strong. Chapter 5, verse 72 of the Quran. We talked about it earlier. This is where you find out that if you believe Jesus is God, you will go to hell. They surely disbelieve who say, Lo, Allah is the Messiah, son of Mary. The Messiah himself said, O children of Israel, worship Allah, my Lord and your Lord. Lo, whoso ascribes partners unto Allah for him has Allah forbidden paradise. His abode is the fire. For evildoers there will be no helpers. What is this saying? They are the disbelievers who say Jesus is God. For them is hell. Paradise has been forbidden. So shirk here. Uh, those who disbelieve here, that's the, the word there is mushrik, those who commit shirk. Shirk, the unforgivable sin, is here defined as believing Jesus is God. Chapter 5, verse 116, I mentioned it earlier. And when Allah says, O Jesus, son of Mary, did you say unto mankind, take me and my mother for two gods beside Allah? He said, be glorified. It was not mine to utter that to which I had no right. If I used to say it, then you would have known it. You know what was in my mind and what is not in my mind. So Jesus essentially is asked, are you saying, did you say to worship you and your mother Mary alongside me? So the image of Trinity here uh, is one where it's father, mother, and son. Very interesting. So that's what the Quran says. That's how the Quran depicts the deity of Jesus Christ. Um, that he denied it uh, and that 
He would never have said it, and this was something that they said after him. Now, I don't use this approach when I argue the deity of Christ with non-Muslims. I use a different approach. But when I'm talking about the deity of Christ with Muslims, I focus on uh, a holistic gospel message. I think the case for the deity of Christ is made far stronger when we involve Paul. I think it it approaches airtight when we involve Paul. Uh, when When we're just looking at the gospels, I say it's very strong. But Muslims will often want to go to the Gospels, and they distrust Paul. They think Paul hijacked the religion. Um, They've got to pin the blame on someone, right? They can't pin it on the disciples. We saw, because of chapter 3, verse 55, the disciples are uppermost. So they can't pin the blame on the disciples. They can't pin the blame on Jesus. Someone corrupted Christianity and corrupted it early on. Who could it be? Ah, here's a man who's persecuting Christians. He never saw Jesus. All of a sudden, he accepts Christ, and he's preaching his Gospel, and other people are preaching Gospels against him. This man must have hijacked Christianity. He's untrustworthy. Uh, Paul. So Muslims, especially Muslim polemicists, hate Paul. And to try to quote 1 Corinthians or uh, Philippians 2 or anything like that to show the deity of Christ would be moot with them. On the flip side, they're generally okay with the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, You've got some Muslim scholars who are beginning to move away from that. Uh, Shabir Ali, for example, has espoused Bart Ehrman's approach. Bart Ehrman argues that the Gospels have an evolution of Christology, Mark being the lowest in Christology, John being the highest in Christology, uh, that they were evolving. Shabir Ali has has kind of embraced that approach, and so he won't take all the Gospels. He won't take John when discussing the deity of Christ. Generally speaking, though, Muslims will take all four. Uh, I'll address that in a moment, Uh, Shabir Ali's approach. So when I discuss with Muslims, I will say, it, when you're talking about the Gospels, it's easy to see that Jesus claims to be God from four different angles. So we take a four-pronged approach here. What Jesus said and what Jesus did, what others said about Jesus and what others did about Jesus. These things only make sense if Jesus is claiming to be God. What are we talking about? Well, first and foremost, what, most, what matters most to Muslims is what Jesus said. They want to hear Jesus say, I am God. And you will hear that objection a lot. Where does Jesus say, I am God, worship me? As a Muslim, when I was looking into these issues, the thing that convinced me was Mark chapter 14, verse 62. I wanted to see it in the earliest of the Gospels. And here's Mark showing Jesus being interrogated by the high priest. The high priest says, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus' response is, I am. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Here you have at least two, if not three, divine references all at once. The questionable one is the I am response. Here in Mark, Uh, It's questionable, but we've seen Jesus say, I am, in John especially, where it's not questionable at all. Jesus' response in John chapter 8 to the Jews, the Jews are saying to him, "Uh, you are not yet even 50 years old, yet you claim to have seen Abraham. Jesus' response is not, hey, uh, I'm just talking figuratively. That's not his response. Um, It's not, no, 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 You, you didn't cast me right. He says, I tell you the truth. Before Abraham was born, I am. There is no way to interpret that verse apart from a divine I am statement. What are these divine I am statements? They're found in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. To begin with, um, Moses is talking to God in the burning bush. And uh, he doesn't want to call God bush. (laughs) Um, So he says to him, Who shall I say has sent me? What's your name? And understand, in those days, especially preliterate dynamics, you got to keep these in mind. In those days, names really mattered. There was power in a name. You would pray in a name. You would would do rituals in a name. Um, Your your deity's power was often shown through their name. And so he wanted to know God's name. He said, who shall I say has sent me when I go talk to the Hebrews? And God responds, I am that I am, or I am who I am. Tell them I am has sent you. God's like, my name doesn't matter. What matters is that I am God. I'm eternal. I am self-subsisting. I am that I am. 
And from that point forward in the Old Testament, God uses the I am to propound his sovereignty multiple times, especially Isaiah 40 through 55. God says over and over again, I am, I am. That's how he propounds his sovereignty. Moses asks God, who are you? And he responds with I am. Here in Mark, the high priest asks Jesus, who are you? And Jesus responds with the I am. I wouldn't think that that was an I am statement, by the way, because the question was, are you the Christ? And Jesus responds, I am. But I hesitate because Mark chapter 6, verse 50, has another I am statement. Here Jesus is walking on the water, something that the Old Testament says only Yahweh can do. Job chapter 9. And the disciples are afraid, and Jesus comes up to the disciples, and he says, take courage, ego e me. Take courage, I am. So here's Jesus doing something that only God can do, and he's giving courage to the disciples by saying the words, I am. A very divine context, a very divine statement. By the way, we have a similar statement in Psalms, I believe, where God is Yahweh, passes over the waters and gives courage to Israel by saying, I am. Strong parallel, or at least a parallel, if you want to be... I want to be careful in our scholarship here. It's at least a parallel. And so the I am statement in Mark 14, 62, if it stood alone, I would say probably not an I am statement. He's just responding to the question. But you've got Mark 6, 50 here. Plus a scholar by the name of Raymond Brown um, in his uh, Death of the Messiah, uh, volume two or one. I don't remember which volume it was. It was uh, Death of the Messiah. Um, he says that John, in using the I am statements, probably has a historical basis because Mark has something reminiscent of that. So even some scholars are saying, there's something here. There's something here. And uh, we would hesitate to say it's a legit I am statement, but there is something there. Let's, let's say it's not an I am statement. What, what's the rest of the verse say? Jesus says, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. All right, now we have definitely two references to the Old Testament. There's no question that these are references. One's almost a quotation. The Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. What's the reference here? Daniel, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Here in Daniel, Jesus is looking in, the, uh, Daniel is looking in the sky, and he has just seen a vision of the Ancient of Days. There's the Ancient of Days sitting on the throne, being worshipped by angels. The Ancient of Days, the God, the Father, he's sitting there on the throne, being worshipped. And then Daniel says, And I looked in my night visions, and behold, one like a son of man approached the Ancient of Days. Okay, so it's one who looks like a son of man approaching the Father. And to him, not the Father, and to the Son of Man, the one who looked like a son of man, was given glory, power, and a kingdom. People of every nation and language will serve him. His kingdom is one that will not pass away and be destroyed. Wait a minute. So... There's a father sitting on the throne. You've got someone who looks like a human. That's what it means. The one who looked like a son of man. Who's given glory in the kingdom of heaven for all eternity. And in that kingdom, people of every nation and language are going to serve him. What kind of service of this is this? You look at the word service in the, in the Hebrew there. It's pelach. I guess it would be in the Aramaic. Um, and in the Greek, the Septuagint, uh, the word is latruo. Every single time. The word latruo is used in the Septuagint and in the New Testament. It's used of a service due only to God. This service is due only to God. Same with the, uh, uh, the word pelach. It's due only to God. There's one uh, instance in the book of Romans where it was given to someone other than God and God became furious because it was due to him. But here we have that service being given to one who looks like a son of man. He's going to be worshipped, served as it were, by all people of all nations in his own kingdom for all eternity. By the way, he's coming on the clouds, the son of man, and only God is introduced in the Old Testament as coming on the clouds. So the entrance is a divine entrance.
Jesus, when he calls himself the Son of Man throughout the Gospels, he calls himself the Son of Man over 80 times if you count all four Gospels. Nobody else ever calls Jesus the Son of Man, not once. There's one occasion in the book of John where, the, uh, where people say, who is this Son of Man? That's it. I mean, that's as close as they get to calling him the Son of Man. So the term Son of Man here is used explicitly by Jesus. It doesn't exist before, um, let me put it this way, they weren't expecting the Messiah to call himself the Son of Man. No one was expecting the Messiah to call himself the Son of Man. And after Jesus, no one, no one refers to him as the Son of Man afterwards. They're not going around calling him the Son of Man, they're calling him the Christ. Why does that matter? That Jesus called himself the Son of Man passes the criterion of double dissimilarity, or the criterion of dissimilarity, as it were. This criterion is the most stringent criterion used by historians to determine whether Jesus actually said something. The most stringent one there is. There's nothing more stringent than that. So that Jesus called himself the Son of Man is virtually certain. Bart Ehrman disagrees with it. He's Bart. And then we got the statement that you're sitting at the right hand of God. What does that mean? Well, this is a reference to Psalm 110, verse 1. Psalm 110, verse 1, David's writing the psalm. It says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, and I shall make the enemies a footstool for your feet. What's the big deal here? No one in the Second Temple period was ever portrayed as sitting at the right hand of God. No one. The reason why is to say that you're sitting at the right hand of God essentially means you're sitting on his throne alongside him, which means you're co-sovereign, you're co-heir. You are in charge with God. If you're sitting on his, on his right hand, that means you are entitled to the same things God is entitled to. You might not have the same office, he's first, you're second, but his substance is shared with you. You are co-heir. And people recognized that at that time. And that's why they never depicted anyone sitting with God. Now, they had people standing. Some people had Moses standing at the right hand of God. Some people had Ezra standing at the right hand of God. But no one ever put anyone sitting at the right hand of God in the Second Temple period. This is probably the most convincing of the three statements here to show exactly what Jesus was saying. At first, I found the Son of Man stuff more convincing. That the more I look into this, the more I realize that sitting at the right hand of power is even stronger. Which is why, by the way, Christians quoted this verse of the Old Testament, Psalm 110, verse 1. They quoted this more than anything else in the New Testament. 24 times this verse is quoted in the New Testament. It meant a lot to them at a very early phase in Christian history. We see it in uh, Matthew as well. Uh, when Jesus is asking them, he's asking the people, who do you think is superior, uh, David or the Messiah? And then he's, he quotes this. So we find it throughout the Gospels. So right here, by the way, when, when Jesus says that he can sit at the right hand of God, do you understand the image that's being drawn here? You've got, you've got the Holy of Holies, which is kind of the inner sanctum. It's a reflection of God in heaven, correct? You guys, you with me? Am I losing you? Do we need to take lunch? Okay, so you got, the, you got the Holy of Holies. This is kind of the reflection of, of God's place in uh, heaven. What is the throne? What is the reflection of the throne in the Holy of Holies? Mercy. The mercy seat, the Ark of the Covenant. Jesus is saying that he can go into the Holy of Holies and sit on the Ark of the Covenant. Yeah. Yeah, that's where Hebrews gets a lot of its Christology from. And Hebrews does quote Psalm 110, verse 1. Now let's stop and think about this for a second. He's talking to the high priest. Who's the high priest? This is the guy who can only go into the Holy of Holies once a year on the Day of Atonement. And when he does that, he wears a rope around his leg in case he accidentally does something blasphemous and they have to drag his dead body out. <laughs> that is the guy he's talking to. He says, I can march in there right now and sit down right on that throne. 
he's, he's not saying anything light here. He is going all out. So in Jesus' words then, Mark 14, 62, he claims to be the I am, if you think that's strong enough, definitely claims to be the son of man coming on the clouds and definitely claims to be sitting at the right hand of the power. Potentially a threefold claim to deity. I am the God of Moses, I am the God of Daniel, and I am the God of David. Which is why they rip open their robes and they say, what more reason is there to question this man? He's committed blasphemy before all of you. Let's crucify him. Abundantly clear that Jesus here claims to be divine. People who argue with that, for example, Bart Ehrman. I, I keep bringing up Ehrman, not because he's you know, my, my, uh, my punching bag, but because he was my professor at UNC, and so I got to interact with him a lot. Um, I asked him, I said, what do you think of Mark 14, 62? Uh, he says, it doesn't make sense. And I said, what do you mean it doesn't make sense? He said, in order for this verse to make sense, Mark would have to think Jesus claimed to be God. <laughs> yes. Yes. And he says it doesn't make sense. Mark doesn't, Mark doesn't know what he's talking about, is what Ehrman says. Um, Ehrman, in order to get around that, Ehrman says that Mark said that uh, or Mark had an improper view of blasphemy. He says Mark had an improper view of blasphemy. This wasn't actually blasphemous. Um, Mark was actually thinking that claiming to be the Messiah was blasphemous, and therefore um, he was crucified for blasphemy. Um, whereas claiming to be the Messiah was not blasphemous in that time. We know that. There were all kinds of people who claimed to be the Messiah, and they were beaten often. They were considered stupid, and they were let go, but they weren't crucified for blasphemy. Um, you're only crucified for blasphemy for either uttering the divine name or according to Philo for, for according divine prerogatives for yourself. Um, so Ehrman says uh, he, he thought that claiming to be the Messiah was blasphemy. No. No, Mark knew that uh, claiming divine prerogatives for yourself is blasphemy. And that's what he's showing Jesus doing. Okay. Anyhow. So that's what Jesus said, and there's a lot more that we could put in there, but I focus on Mark 14, 62. What did Jesus do to this end? Well, according to the Gospels, he forgave sins. Mark chapter 2, uh, so that you may know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise. Chapter 2, verse 10 of Mark. Uh, he, he heals a paralytic, forgiving him his sins. What did everyone respond at that time? What did the scribes and Pharisees, I think it was, in that event, what did they respond by saying? This man blasphemes. This man blasphemes. Why are they saying that? Because Jesus is according a divine prerogative for himself, the forgiveness of sins. In addition, Jesus does miracles in his own name. Um, he will, uh, lepers will come to him and they will say, can you cleanse us? Two lepers come to him in Matthew, I think it's chapter 8. They say, can you cleanse us? And he says, do you believe that I can do this? And they say, yes. And he says, by your faith, it shall be done. Faith in whom? In him. He said, do you believe I can do this? He's doing his, this miracle in his own name. And that's extremely important. You don't see anyone doing that in the Old Testament. You don't see Elijah doing a miracle in his own name. You don't see Elisha doing a miracle in his own name. They're doing it in Yahweh's name. Jesus does it in his own name. What do others say about Jesus? Okay, what do you have John saying about Jesus? You have John saying uh, that uh, Jesus is the word of God and that he is God, John chapter one, uh, and that nothing came into being except through him. Bless you. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He makes it abundantly clear that he's talking about Jesus. And then in verse 18, he says that Jesus is the only begotten God, John 1:18. So John makes it very clear that Jesus is God. And so does Thomas. At the end of John's Gospel, Thomas bows down. I believe it's 2028. 20, he bows down and says to Jesus, My Lord and my God. Kuriasmu kai theasmu. The same construction is used in Psalms. Uh, it's inverted, but it's referring to Yahweh. My Lord and my God. Or my God and my Lord in Psalms. Here it's made really clear. In fact, some people believe that this is the climax of John's gospel, the proclamation from Thomas that Jesus is God. 
And what is it others did about Jesus? Okay, well, this only makes sense if Jesus claimed to be God. You have some people who worshipped him. Uh, we see the disciples worshipping him in the boat, um, proskuneo. Uh, you see, um, well, there are plenty who bow down to Jesus, and, it's, and uh, the word proskuneo can be translated worship. Muslims will often respond to that, by the way. They'll say, look, in the Old Testament, people are bowing down before others. Proskuneo means just bow down. They didn't actually worship him. They just bowed down. Uh, well, not necessarily, because what does Matthew and Luke say? Uh, they say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. I believe that's 4.10. Jesus says, you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Well, the word worship there, you must worship the Lord your God only, that's proskuneo. So Jesus says, don't bow down to anyone, which is exactly why in Acts you see when people start bowing down to Paul and Barnabas, that they rip their clothes and they say, we are not gods, don't do that. When, uh, when Cornelius bows down before Peter, he says, don't do that, I am just like you. Um, and John in the book of Revelation, uh, when he bows down to the angel, the angel says, no, 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 I'm just a servant, don't bow down to me, don't proskuneo, because Jesus said, you must proskuneo to God alone. And yet, people bowed down to Jesus in the Gospels, and he was fine with that. In fact, in 2028, in, in John, when Thomas does that, he says, yeah, it's about time. <laughs> you know? <laughs> On the other hand, those who were against Jesus, what did they do? They crucified him for blasphemy. Well, what was blasphemy at the time? Um, you can read Daryl Bach's work uh, on blasphemy. It's probably the most comprehensive. Um, I think it's called uh, Blasphemy and Exaltation in Judaism. I think that's the name of his book. Uh, a shorter work is by uh, Adela Yarbrough Collins um, called The Blasphemy in Mark 1462. Both very good works. What was blasphemy at the time? It was either uttering the divine name Yahweh, that would be blasphemy at that time, or it was uh, according divine prerogatives to yourself. And we get that through Philo. Um, Philo was writing, uh, and in his writings he indicated that simply saying that you have things that belong only to God is considered blasphemy. How do you spell Philo? P-H-I-L-O. One of my favorite scholars on this issue is Richard Bauckham, and if you can, he has a small book called uh, God Crucified. Small book, quick to read. What he points out is that Jesus is claiming for himself, and the early Christians claimed for Jesus, those attributes, specifically those attributes with, which distinguish Yahweh from everything else. So he says there are two things which distinguish Yahweh from everything else, creator and sovereign creator and sovereign. And he says in early Christianity, both titles were ascribed to Jesus, creator and sovereign. Um, and his work, I think, is pretty convincing. He has a parallel, um, slightly different, um, but uh, Larry Hurtado, so Richard Bauckham is the first guy, B-A-U-C-K-H-A-M, Richard Bauckham, just retired out of Edinburgh. God Crucified. Actually, it was Larry Hurtado just retired out of Edinburgh. And Larry Hurtado. Read Larry Hurtado as well. Um, the one I would read, uh, probably the shortest and most concise, is How on Earth Did Jesus Become God? It's a tongue-in-cheek title. Um, Larry Hurtado, uh, Hurtado, H-U-R-T-A-D-O. Larry Hurtado argues that the titles accorded to Jesus Wait, I'm sorry, that was Bauckham. Uh, Larry Hurtado argues that the uh, rituals performed in Jesus' name, the actions that were performed, um, those are something that were only for God. So for example, baptism, uh, communion. These were actions that were done for God alone. And the fact that we see them in 1 Corinthians 11, um, and we see it in pre-New Testament writings, uh, I'll explain that in a moment, um, shows that they did it extremely early on. So Hurtado and Bauckham, two extremely well-respected scholars, Hurtado and Bauckham both very well-respected, 
uh, argue early deity of Jesus Christ, early high Christology, and they do so very convincingly. Both just retired, though. It's kind of sad. Any questions on that? I saw some hands and some confusion. General aura of confusion emanating. One last thing I want to look at, though, is the early history of the New Testament. Um, why did I put this here? Oh, I shouldn't have put this here. Oh, well, I'll do it anyway. Um, let's take a look and stop for a second at some of the earliest stuff. So what I just gave you was an argument from the Gospels for Muslims. Okay, so we think about it for a second. Muslims are okay with the Gospels, generally speaking. Some of them are not okay with John, like Shabir Ali. Um, but they're okay with the Gospels in general. That's why I gave you that case. But let's stop and let's take a look at the ho case holistically, uh, not just from a Muslim perspective. Let's look at the case for the deity of Jesus Christ. We have in our possession, and this is extremely critical for you to know. If you're interested in uh, New Testament studies and apologetics in the least, you need to know this. In the New Testament, there are references to hymns and creeds that were written before the New Testament was written. What do I mean by that? Certain things are found in the New Testament that are quotes that had been composed earlier. One of the most famous of those is 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 to 8, where Paul says, For what I received I delivered to you as of first importance, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, according to the scriptures, etc. And he says that he was raised and he appeared to Peter and to the disciples and then to the 500, and then last of all to me as one untimely born. What is Paul doing? Well, according to the Jesus Seminar, so these aren't folks who are evangelicals, to say the least. Uh, according to the Jesus Seminar, what Jesus is doing, I'm sorry, what Paul is doing is he's quoting something that he received from the disciples early on. So early, in fact, that it probably comes from the first 10 years of Christian history, and that's a very conservative statement. John, uh, I'm sorry, James D.G. Dunn, uh, in his book, Jesus Remembered, says that this section of the New Testament, so this creed from 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8, is no later than a few months after Jesus' crucifixion. And James D.G. Dunn is no one to mess with either. Very highly respected New Testament scholar. So, months after the crucifixion. What, what, how many months? One year? 18 months? I don't think he would have said the word months if he meant more than two years. So uh, I, asked, uh, I asked Mike Lacona what he thought, and he thinks that uh, it couldn't be any later than 18 months. Then again, we could just email Dr. Dunn, see what he says. So we have this creed, which mentions the death of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection within 18 months of Jesus' death, according to Dunn, and no one says any later than 40 AD. Uh, no one I've read, and um, O'Connell uh, also says he doesn't know, and he's a scholar, he doesn't know anyone who, uh, who puts it later than four, uh, 40 AD. And you can get a lot of this from Habermas's book in the back. We also have a creed in Philippians 2, verses 6 through 11. Here Paul is quoting a hymn. If you read Philippians carefully, Paul's going through and he's saying, be humble, stop trying to put yourselves above one another, start serving each other. And then he says, your attitude should be like that of Christ who, although he existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. And so he emptied himself. And so you have this picture of the kenosis, the divine emptying of God, to the point of becoming a human and dying on the cross. And then because of this, God raises him up. And he uh, exalts him, and at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Well, what's going on here? Paul's writing to the Philippians, and in the middle of writing to them, he quotes a hymn. How can he quote it unless he knows that they already know it? Which means he's either said it to them before, or he told it to them when he established the church. Well, if he said it to them when he established the church, that means it was composed even before that. So this hymn in Philippians 2, 6 through 11 is extremely early. How early? 
Uh, some people have argued that you can retrovert this creed, I'm sorry, this hymn, into Aramaic. If you put it in Aramaic, it forms a hymn of five stanzas, three lines each, with meter. There's one intrusion in there, even death on a cross doesn't fit the scheme, but other than that, the rest of it fits perfectly, according to some scholars. If that is the case, if this hymn was actually composed in Aramaic, we probably have the earliest teaching of the Christian church. Jesus was in very nature God. And he lowered himself to the point of a man, died on the cross, and then was raised. Uh, he was exalted is what it says. And at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess. That's a quotation from Isaiah, which describes Yahweh. In Isaiah, it says, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess to Yahweh. Here, it's saying it will happen to Jesus in a creed, which may have come from the Aramaic-speaking church. As early as it gets, it doesn't get any earlier. There are also arguments that Mark's passion narrative is extremely early. Um, I had planned on covering this later, but I'll cover it now. In Mark's Passion Narrative, um, you can get this, by the way, from Gert Tyson, G-E-R-D, Gert Tyson, T-H-E-I, T-H-E-I-S-S-E-N, Gert Tyson, he's a German scholar. Gert Tyson argues that in Mark's Passion Narrative, you have names that are conspicuously missing. For example, in the Garden of Gethsemane, somebody strikes the ear of the high priest. I'm sorry, the ear of the servant of the high priest. Who is it? It's kind of important. It would be good to know. We find out in one of the later Gospels that it's Peter. Why isn't it said in Mark's time? Okay, why don't we get the name of the servant in Mark's Gospel, in Mark's Passion Narrative? And who is this boy who runs away naked? What's that about? You know, who is this guy? Why don't we get his name? You really want to know his name. You want to know who he is. <laughs> You know, and so why don't we know who it is? Why is the name not given? Gert Tyson argues that Mark didn't provide these names for protective anonymity. If he were to say Peter was the person who struck the ear, guess what? They would go get Peter because they were still looking for him. They still wanted to know who did it. If they say this was the boy who evaded police arrest, they would go get him because he was still wanted. If they said Malchus was the name of the servant, they would go ask him, who cut off your ear? And he'd be able to point him to the right person. So according to Gert Tyson, the reason why the names are not mentioned is because this is so early that it could be not mentioned for reasons of protective anonymity. Richard Bauckham takes the argument further, and I think convincingly so, in his book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. Richard Bauckham, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. He says that you have names that are present that are rather stark. We take a look at, for example, Bartimaeus. Why in the world is blind Bartimaeus' name mentioned? There's a ton of blind people who are healed. Why was Bartimaeus' name mentioned? You also have in the Passion narrative, you've got Simon of Cyrene mentioned, and he's mentioned in the other Gospels too. But here it says, whose sons are Rufus and Alexander in Mark 15. Why mention Rufus and Alexander? I mean, the other Gospels didn't mention him. Matthew, Luke, they don't mention Rufus and Alexander. Why does Mark mention Rufus and Alexander? Any ideas? Go talk, to Go talk to him. Mark is saying, hey, you guys know Rufus and Alexander? Their dad was Simon of Cyrene. Go ask him about this. That's what Richard Bauckham is saying. Simon uh, of Alexander's sons are still around to verify the claim that's being made. Bar Bartimaeus is still around to verify that he was healed. Therefore, their names are mentioned. That's what Richard Bauckham argues. Richard Bauckham is very interested in onomastics, the study of names. Um, so you can read his work on that. It's in Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. Very interesting. So what are we saying here? We're saying the passion narrative is so early that some people are still wanted and some people who are there are still around. 
There are other, other reasons to think Marx's passion narrative is extremely early. Many of the elements of Marx's passion narrative are found in Paul's works. For example, 1 Corinthians 11 talks about the Last Supper, which is in Mark 14. You have on the night he was handed over in 1 Corinthians. That kind of assumes that the people Paul is talking to have already heard this story of a night that Jesus was handed over, right? If he says on the night he was handed over to the Corinthians, he thinks that they already know what he's talking about. And that's what Mark talks about. There was a night in which Jesus was betrayed. Jesus suffering in Paul. Paul makes it very clear that Jesus suffered. Mark talks a lot about Jesus suffering. So you've got a lot of parallels between Paul's writings and Mark's passion narrative, which make you think that Mark's passion narrative was extremely early. For all these reasons, Mark's passion narrative can be dated, potentially, not with a lot of confidence, but with some confidence, to an early, early date, perhaps even in the 40s or 50s, maybe even in the 30s. There's one argument that it was in the 30s. I don't know about this, but uh, the argument is, um, who mentions Caiaphas' name? Matthew. Who doesn't mention it? Mark. When Mark says the high priest, why doesn't he say the high priest Caiaphas? The argument goes, because Caiaphas was still the high priest. So all he had to say was the high priest, and they knew who he was talking about. Well, Caiaphas stopped being the high priest in 37 AD. So if that argument is sound, then Mark's passion narrative is before 37 AD. How early, who knows, but it's really early according to these arguments and definitely predates the actual writing of Mark. So what do we have? We have the earliest layer of New Testament, uh, earliest layer of Christian history in the New Testament. And what do those layers proclaim? 1 Corinthians 15, three through eight, proclaims the death and resurrection of Jesus. Philippians 2, six through 11, proclaims the death, deity, and resurrection of Jesus. And Mark, death, deity, and resurrection of Jesus. The earliest layer of Christian history in the New Testament proclaims exactly those things we ought to believe in order to be saved, according to Romans 10.9. Coincidence? I don't think so. This is good to know for your own personal edification. This is also good to know for Islamic apologetics. Um, if you're gonna converse with Muslims, it's good to be able to say with confidence, the earliest level of Christian history is that which proclaims the deity of Christ, his death on the cross, and his resurrection from the grave. That is precisely the things that Muslims don't want early Christianity to proclaim. Biola University offers a variety of biblically centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.